Sandro Martinez is a Manchester United player. Jules Kunde, is he on his way to Chelsea? Reports this afternoon that that deal is now close again. We're talking Tony from Brentford to Man United as the Ronaldo replacement. Sane to Arsenal. Anthony hijacked by Liverpool. And of course, we're talking about the clubs and their business and their fans as well. That's the most important bit on this show live. Don Hussam is here with me again on Sunday evening. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. Happy to be back on on the terrace. It's been a while. Happy to be back on the show as well. Um, you know, uh, this is this is a very interesting time. The, the transfer window. You know, it, it it's it tells you a lot about a lot of different people, a lot of different clubs, a lot of different players. So it's a very interesting time. Thanks for having me. And as well, big up everyone in the comment section. Make sure you hit that like button. Absolutely. And of, of course, uh, we're going to delve into Liverpool a bit later on the show. We're going to touch Arsenal. You know, Chelsea have got a lot of business going on as well. Jules Kunde news to update everybody with and, and kind of have a bit of a uh, debate around that. But Manchester United uh, made their third su summer signing. Lissandro Martinez over the line. Um, £45 million. Pounds potentially going up as high as 53, 52, 53 million with an £8 million pound add-on. Suddenly, his height and his best position is now. I've never seen a centre back's height such a focus as, as this is. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, what's your take on Man United's bit of business here? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how you're going to spin this into a positive. Just kidding. Um, so, <laughs> when it comes to, to, to Manchester United, look, um, they've done well. I think Martinez is, of course, a, a good signing. Um, I think the other who's who's the other, I keep forgetting. Ericsson is, is the other second guy. The third guy, I keep forgetting. Who's the third uh, guy you got him? Malassia, young left. Malassia, Malassia. Um, so I think, like, look, they've done good business so far. Um, not necessarily have addressed every single thing they need to address yet, which I don't think is possible in one transfer window. But, you know, we had this conversation, me and you, before on, on the Ten Hag thing. Is he reaching into that pocket a little bit too much? Malassia, Martinez, Ericsson. And I'm not even trying to start something here or, or speak something crazy. I think it's just... Something that people will question. But I think, look, Fabio Cannavaro was a short defender and he did really well. He won a Ballon d'Or as, as a defender. So, you know, a player's height, I don't think necessarily means anything. Specifically with players now. In 2022, players now are more athletic, are, are way more ready. Sports science, developments, nutrition, the way they take the sport seriously. You know, you can see players now that are five foot eight, five foot nine, five foot ten, elevate to, 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 to levels that you've probably only seen, you know, maybe the likes of Peter Crouch get to. So it's it's a different sort of discussion now 20 years on from maybe the the usual football that we grew up watching i know you grew up watching a different generation but like the one that you know that 20 year old people you know grew up watching um so i think it's good business uh, i still think there's there's many questions but one thing i will say though is with, with the game that i watched against the you know the liverpool united game obviously Pre-season, it never matters the result. The results never matter. It's always about what you can learn from the games, the performances. Yeah. And I think looking at United's academy, there's a few prospects there that could really be helpful and useful this season. Very, very helpful. You know, you got the likes of Zidane Iqbal, you got the likes of Savage, Charlie Savage. He he done really well. Um, there's a third guy as well who, who really impressed me against uh, Liverpool. Three youngsters I thought did uh, specifically well. Like they they shone more than anyone else sort of in those games. And I think those players, you know, are, are, are also players that you can use. And, and this is why having a great academy is, is a major positive. So, so far, so good. Don't quite think United are going to get top four yet. So we're going to have to wait and see, but good business. So. And, I don't and I don't necessarily disagree with the top four thing yet. I, I think we have to wait and see how the football translates. Man United are a really hard one to kind of gauge. It's why I've pushed back from being drawn into these debates over, are we ready to start the season? Maybe, maybe not. But this season isn't, there, there, there aren't the expectations this season on Man United as there are with everybody else inside the top six. We have got. I'm not. I'm not going to be shameless and say it's a free hit season. We need to improve. We need to become better, more competitive. We need a better style of football. We need to win more games than last year. We need to push for that top four. We have to try and win the cup competitions that we're in, including the Europa League. There are standards still. But everything's starting from scratch again. A new way of coaching. New ideas. 
So we're just where Liverpool were year one with Jurgen Klopp. We're where Arsenal were year one with Mikel Arteta. Because this isn't like when Pep took over City, a team that had, you know just won a league title. This is a club that hasn't competed for a major trophy in a decade. So the situation is very, very different. And I think you're absolutely right when it comes to the young players because uh, Zidane Iqbal looks looks excellent. I'm really impressed with him. Charlie Savage, I mean, already better than his dad, uh, to, to be honest with you. As, 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 as a technical <laughs> footballer. And they're the little things where there's just part of me that thinks, let's just, I don't want to go out and buy 10 players. I don't. I want to see two or three of these youngsters given an opportunity. One of the elements of Ajax and Man United, which over the over the decades has mirrored each other, has been the want to develop from your youth academy. And I feel over the years, United have let some real talented players slip through the cracks. Uh, ironically, Paul Pogba, as an example, you know, I want to see some of these players given a bit more time. And, and, you know, and, and sometimes you get more, there's more leeway in doing that when you're building something. And I think many United fans have got this approach of let's go out and sign 10 players. Let's try and win the league this year, year one with Ten Hag. That's the kind of way we try to do things with all the previous managers. Let's just buy now, spend big and, tr and try and win straight away. And every time it's fouled. So I want to go about it differently. On the Sandro Martinez, yeah, he's, he's short for a centre back, and I'm seeing so Adi Akinfenwa on Talk Sports say I'd be targeting him. Oh my God, look how short he is! And I get the banter, and, and it is what it is. But when you think about the facts, you know, just I was doing some research on it earlier, and I just googled it like short centre backs, and then you start reading the names of players that have played centre back: Carlos Puyol, five five ten; Xavi Mascherano was a midfielder but played a lot of games at centre back for Pep, five eight. So Bobby Moore was just under 5'10", as an example. And there's loads more. Frank Frank De Boer, under six foot. Franz Beckenbauer, under six foot. There's a Franco Baresi, 5'9". Uh, you already mentioned um, Cannavaro, 5'9". There's been... A, and that's like quality centre-backs have mentioned there. Does that make sense? Like, they're not talking... Yeah. And it's probably hundreds more that, that you never heard of that were 5'9", 5'10", and whatever else. I'm not that worried about it. Equally with the price, I'm seeing Man United... It, the worst bit is I get people like Egal tweeting and trying to make fun of it. It's like, fair enough. Like, great. It's the Man United fans that are biting on it, where it's like, bro, why are you biting... The day that he signed his deal with Man United, Arteta was on the phone begging him to come and play for Arsenal. Arsenal would have bid the same as us. Arsenal wanted a five foot, <laughs> a five foot nine centre back as well. Falling for their banter is crazy. I kind of get Liverpool and Chelsea fans doing it, but falling for an Arsenal fans banter on a player that they wanted, their according to Ornstein, their priority signing, like. Why are we allowing, why are Man United fans being so weak to allow the banter to fall on them? I'm sitting there laughing to myself again. They are so hurt. They're having to find a way of comfort in it. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, it's a good thing my girlfriend cheated on me. At least I don't have to waste any more money taking her out for dinner. <laughs> As I'm crying into my handkerchief. That's what it sounds like to me. And I, I even, said, even I haven't bantered United because, you, listen, you, you recognize that he's a good player and he'll definitely improve Man United. Plus, you've got versatility that he provides as well because he could play left back, could play left centre back, could play centre back in a back three, could possibly play in a double pivot as well. So you've got the versatility. Listen, the best player that's ever played football is short. Lionel Messi, my goat personally, like the greatest I've ever seen, is short. Like his height is still my belly button. That does not mean that he's not a hundred times better than, at well, football than me. So even even if you are a centre back, yeah. this, I, I don't think centre backs in 2022 need to be these giants that they used to be, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, you know, height height has never been something you actually use against well, a player. I've never seen that to be honest. Well, we have a we have a we have a giant at the back in Maguire, but we don't want him. It's about being the right player, and you know, there's always this this Premier League, this English football thing. Angolo Kante, if he was signed now and nobody knew who he was to be a new enforcer in midfield, everybody would go. But he's basically a jockey, you know. Mm. He should have been an extra on the hundred, you know, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Like he's too small, and he's been one of the best midfielders in Premier League history, in my opinion. So, yeah, look for me as a Man United fan, I, I keep, I, I don't get annoyed at the banter. People think, oh, you can't take banter, Terry. That isn't what I get annoyed at. I find a lot of the banter boring. And maybe it's because I'm a bit older and it's like, oh, you're all saying the same thing. You know, every now, like I saw someone, uh, Frankie De Jong, someone made a comment the other day where they called it, where they called him frankly too long. And that made me laugh. Well, that's a, a, a quip and a play on words. But everyone mimicking the height, 
I'm like, oh, you're all doing the same thing as each other. Like, none of you are original. That's boring to me. But I'm happy with a player. I really, really am. I think he's going to do bits for Manchester United uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, viewers, by the way, if we hit 1,250 likes while we are live, I will give away 20 free memberships to you live on the air. So make sure you're smashing that like button. We've also got a poll running as well asking, do Liverpool need more players to be able to win the league? I do want your take on that, people. Um, we're going to get onto Liverpool later in the show. And we will come back to Manchester United as well. Um, I want to talk Chelsea next before we do these super chats. First one here says, what's up, my people? Dom uh, Hussam in the house. Let's go FSG out. And we'll get on to Big up to you, Dom Pay, man. Big up, big up, Chumbe. Big up Tell and Hussam thoughts on Madison to Tottenham. And we'll come on, we'll come back to that one a little bit later. It's an interesting one, actually. Thoughts on Maguire's role in Eric Ten Hag's system could put him at di- no, you're not putting Maguire can't go in midfield, he's got no legs. Oh, <laughs> you get overrun. So listen, M- Maguire will play for Ten Hag this year. And if he doesn't get back to at least his first season levels, he'll be gone next summer, in my opinion. But he was never gonna with the fact that we've got less available players like injury prone players and worse center backs. So Phil Jones is still worse than him. Like <laughs> they've got to go first. Like there's so much that, that you've got to get rid of the, the genuine crap. And I know I, I'm not a fan of Maguire at the minute at all, but he's going to be given a year. He'll play at center back. He won't be moved into midfield. I don't think there'll be anything crazy or obscure done by the manager to kind of shoot, shoot horny men. And if, Lissandro is as good as we think he'll be and Varane can stay fit for more than two or three games on the bounce. I don't be- believe it'll be too long until we don't see very much of Maguire, which is why the whole keeping him as captain thing doesn't really matter because if he's, if he's played out of the team and he isn't playing, he's not really the captain, is he? You know, it, it's, there's no need. If you're, if you're thinking of not playing him, there's no need to add insult to injury and strip the captaincy. Just keep him as club captain. You've got other leads on the pitch that can lead and move forward from there. Listen, day gamer, thank you for, for the super chat and stuff, but switch off FIFA, man. Maguire can't play DM. <laughs> you know, they ask me the same question on Matip. You, do, you reckon Matip could play DM? No, he can't. Like, leave the centre-backs in the centre-back position. Don't, don't try to bring them into midfield. It's a whole different conversation. If you bring Maguire into midfield, suddenly you're going to need work rate. Suddenly you're going to need legs, exactly what Terry mentioned. Suddenly you're going to need high footballing IQ. Suddenly you're going to might need Maguire to dictate tempo in a game or two. So it definitely won't work, man. Definitely. And, and at the age of those two players, learning to... Like Paul Pog was one of the only tall midfielders I, I've seen at the elite level that that's actually nimble enough to be able to move in midfield. Defend, and it's why it's why Joe Linton surprises me so much. He shouldn't be able to do what he does. But at the age of Matip and the age and the age of Maguire, I don't think they could even adjust their bodies to be able to operate right. in midfield consistently. I think it'd be too hard for them. But there we go. Uh, one of the other transfers that's, that's circulating today, and this involves Chelsea. Our big headline tonight is: there's a report that's come out uh, from Manu Saints that Chelsea are close to signing Jules Kunde. They expect to reach a full agreement soon. Fabrizio has given a different flavor to this, very much along the lines of, you know, Chelsea are preparing new discussions with Kunde's um, agents, but kind of Barcelona are meant to be sort of leading this race as it stands right now. Where, firstly, the first question is, where do you see Jules Kunde going? And then I kind of want to get your thoughts on Chelsea's business so far. I, I think with, with Kunde, he's going Barca. I, I just think, like, and, and, and look, I'm... I'm I'm very prideful of, of the club I support, but even I can move that pride to the side and sort of recognize that Barcelona and Real Madrid, regardless, are the two most attractive clubs to go to for a whole generation of players. Like Liverpool and Man City, in my opinion, are the two most attractive clubs in England. If Darwin Nunes was offered to Barcelona or Real Madrid, he'd think about it. He possibly might choose Barcelona or Madrid over Liverpool if they offer the same money. It's, it's a possibility. I think... The generations now that maybe, you know, that the people who are 10, 15 now maybe are changing towards more like Premier League maybe based. But you're looking at, at the players who are 20, 21, 22, 23 now who are looking to make those moves. I think Barcelona and Real Madrid still are like, you know, the, the two most attractive clubs in the world. And it's nothing against Chelsea, but Barcelona is is more attractive to, to, to Jules Kunde. He plays in, in La Liga as well, plays for Sevilla, so he knows exactly what Barcelona are on about. Uh, he knows the club. He's probably played in the camp now many times. So he knows what, what Barcelona football club is. He knows what Real Madrid is. Those are the, the two clubs that you sort of will have a, a, a tough time sort of attracting players versus them. And I think like 
I don't think Chelsea needs Kunde per se as well for that amount of money. Because here's here's how I look at it. You've signed Koulibaly, you've you have got Thiago, Thiago Silva, you've got Shaloba, who's a fantastic defender, by the way, regardless of his age. Shaloba is I think everyone's looking at the wrong youngsters for Chelsea. I think Shaloba is gonna be impressive. I think with Chelsea now when with signing Koulibaly, Koulibaly is a top five center back in world football. Top five. Been been so maybe for the last four or five years. If we were to do like a top five list, Koulibaly, Van Dyke, you know, those players are gonna be up there in, in that top five list. With with the Chelsea business. The one thing that has shocked me, though, and this is something that I've spoken to Chelsea fans throughout the year, they've always spoken on midfield, 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 midfield. And the fact that they've not got, gotten any midfielder, and, and you know, you speak on Kunde, they're not just linked to, they're linked to Ake as well, and they're linked to Kimpembe as well. I don't get, like, this focus on the centre-back position ahead of everything else. The signings they've made so far, fantastic signings, but I thought they would probably look at midfield more than they were, they're looking at, at the centre-backs, but for me personally, I think Kunde is going Barcelona, man. And there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing. You could offer him more well, money. He just wants Barca. I think the one thing that, that can be done is it, there's always conflicting reports, but it's being reported again today that all these new signings that Barca have announced are, are still can't be registered until they lower their wage bill. And it, what's interesting, I was talking to somebody about the actual process of transfers the other day. They were, they were taking me through from the moment a player verbally agrees and that's typically now when you get the here we go, by the way, if you're saying journalist, mm. he said it's, it takes between five to 10 days from that point to complete a transfer. That's a, a player in the summer, a player being on holiday, waiting to get back, booking in the medicals. The medical takes two days. One thing I didn't, I didn't know about medicals was this. When you complete your medical, everything gets signed off by the buying club and then sent through to the selling club who then cross reference everything. And they have the rubber stamp it. Like all these things take time. Right. But what the, the, the Spanish clubs and a lot of the, the European clubs do is they announce their signings pending medical, pending legal sign off and pending the, 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 the money going through or like the first payment or the initial, whatever it may be where the premier league clubs don't announce anything until all of that is done. So Barca are announcing all these players and players are signing for them. But they can't register them right now. And unless they look, you've got Memphis that might leave, who's on fairly big money. You've got De Jong that might leave, who's on fairly big money. But these players don't go for one reason or another, for one reason or another. And we're, we're going to get onto De Jong a little bit later. That's where I think a team like Chelsea still has a chance and an opportunity. This player wanted Chelsea. He's had terms agreed with Chelsea for over a year. And I think if Chelsea really wanted to, I think they could have had him signed off weeks back but they obviously moved their attention to Koulibaly Raheem Sterling's mm -hmm. coming and it's interesting you mentioned the DM things it was one of my kind of talking points for tonight was around there does seem to be this huge ob obsession with DMs and a certain profile of DM you know someone who breaks up play someone who's strong and robust and you know a little bit of a you know can crunch into a tackle can cover all the ground almost everybody wants a type of Antonio um, Antonio Angolo Kante type player you know Fabinho as an example and I just, I, I kind of feel like there's more than one way to skin a cat. And I get this sense and feeling from Tuchel that he's actually fairly happy with his midfield. They've got some targets. We know Declan Rice is one of them. But it's almost, I actually want to improve our back line more than I actually want to improve the midfield right now. And you got to think they have lost two to three centre-backs as well, so it's become a priority. And it'll be interesting to see if it's Kimpembe, if it's Jules Kunde, the next player Chelsea go for. Because I do think, personally, they need another attacker on top of what they've already got. But, you know, Kunde is going to be an interesting... Kunde will be um, an interesting one. David here says, because DMs are important, Terry. I understand that midfielders are important. I understand that. I What I'm focusing on is there's a certain profile of midfielder that everybody is desperate for their teams to get. And, you know, United fans have been bleating on about it. <clears throat> DM, have you listened to the reports? If we got De Jong, De Jong will be playing as a deep-line playmaker, Michael Carrick-esque. Michael Carrick was a DM. You don't always need someone who is an out and out. You know, Marco... you, you don't need a destroyer. You don't. You don't yeah. always need an DD type player. You, you can. You can get someone who can. You can do both, basically. Exactly. And that, that's that's what I find a weird obsession. You see these players links and, and their best positions and how they play and the roles they're in. Now nah, we need someone who can break up that play. Or how about you buy someone that doesn't need to crunch into tackles and they're so intelligent they read the play and they just intercept these balls. Michael Carrick wasn't a cruncher, but he used to Busquets win the ball. as well. Busquets was great at it. You know, Michael Carrick used to win the ball back in midfield more than Steven Gerrard did. But you re you remember Gerrard's more because they were like tackles and like shoulder to shoulder fights. But Michael Carrick was more intelligent in terms of reading the play. He didn't need to do it. And that's Let's why leave the Aston Villa manager alone. 
Daddy, let's leave him alone. Michael he's got Carrick. the team to bat. He's got the team to bat. Steven Gerrard was better than Michael Carrick, but Michael Carrick was better than Gerrard in a deeper role. When let, 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 let me just say one thing on, on the DM stuff you're saying. It's, it's, I find it very interesting. First of all, I don't know what it is with these German managers trusting the midfield they currently have. Uh, but with, with, with Tuchel, I don't think, like, when you look at that midfield, from the outside looking in, no emotional investment whatsoever. Kovacic is their best midfielder. He's injury prone. He's their best midfielder. You've got Kante, who's regressing slightly. You've got Jorginho, who's slowing down. And then you've got these young sort of midfielders that you're kind of unsure on. I've seen as well Tuchel play Shaloba in, in that sort of DM role as well. So he might be experimenting uh, and he might be trying different stuff, but Chelsea 100% need a midfielder. They 100% do. And, and the reason why they 100% need a midfielder is every time you've watched Chelsea, and you know, it's, it's, it's always fun bantering them about how boring it is to watch Chelsea and stuff. And listen, banter is never going to stop. It is what it is. But when it comes to Chelsea, the thing is, the way they move, from defense to attack is very slow. And because it's very slow, they need someone to speed things up for them, like a tempo setter, someone that, you know, just like, okay, chop, chop, we're going to get it going now. And I feel like when it comes to, to, to Chelsea, they, they just attack so slowly, so slowly. Like the buildup's just so slow. Like when you, when you watch Chelsea, you're sort of going like, okay, they've got 60% possession, whatever it is, but, if not, but you're not seeing them create chance after chance after chance. And, and, and that's why I think even most Chelsea fans would agree that they do need a midfielder. So when it comes to, 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 to the midfield situation, I really believe that when it comes to, to, to Chelsea Football Club, They've done great business so far. Sterling is great business. Koulibaly is great business. Both, both are fantastic signings. But now what they need to do is, for me, before looking at other centre-backs, they've got to address that midfield. It needs to be addressed. And, and, and I agree with the, with the whole, you know, the destroyer stuff. Look, Fabinho is someone who can do the destroyer stuff, but he does the other stuff as well. Rodri can do the destroyer stuff. He does the other stuff as well. Casemiro, Sam, like, you know, the best DMs in the world. Kimmich, best DMs in the world. They can they can do all that stuff at the same time. They can do the, the destroyer stuff and the other stuff. So it's not like necessarily you just need a player who you just put him in, 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 in the midfield and, and just tackle and that's it. Like, you need yeah. someone who can do a bit of everything. I, I, listen, I, I agree, and I think that they do need a new midfielder. They're obviously linked to uh, Nunes, which Liverpool are now linked to as well. We did a video on that earlier earlier on today, and the Portuguese press have been on, hot on, very accurate this year in terms of players connected to or playing in Portugal. So it's going to be intriguing to see how that how that plays out. But there's a comment I read, and I've, I've missed, I missed it. Now, by the way, if you put a super chat, we will come to your super chat at the end of each club section and kind of go through them. And some of you will save to later so, they, so that we do them in a relevant conversation. I'll try to keep the conversation on if we just we're talking Man United, then we suddenly start talking about a, a, a Spurs link, it kind of messes the flow of the show. So we'll save it. Don't worry, we'll put it out there. 1250 likes. We're going to gift out some memberships to you as well. How many YouTube channels? We've given away 150 free memberships this month, you know. Um, so keep hitting that like and that share button. But there's a comment that said I didn't really rate Michael Carrick. And the thing is, there comes a point where opinion uh, everyone's entitled to an opinion, but it's a bit like saying, I don't think the Beatles were any good. It's, it's like saying, I don't think Elvis Presley was good. Now, you don't need to like Elvis Presley. You don't need to like the Beatles. You don't need to like Jay-Z. You don't need to like Michael Jackson. I'm naming you know, Queen. You don't. These are all like global stars. Not everyone's going to like all their music, but to say they're not good at what they did is stupidity. When you are a, a midfielder for nigh on a decade, okay, in, in, a man, in a Man United team, when you've won... Umpteen Premier Leagues, Champions Leagues, three Champions League finals, every cup imaginable, and you have been a linchpin. You have been so consistent in that team for a decade in the, what I still believe to be the hardest league in the world. For anyone to say, I don't think Michael Carrick is that good, I think it's a, a very poor opinion. However, it proves my point. Michael Carrick wasn't a fashionable player. He didn't do anything where people went, oh, wow. Two or three years ago, destroyers were out of fashion. Everybody wanted a Regista. Everybody wanted a Michael Carrick or a Busquets-style player, someone that was like a Rolls-Royce in, in the middle. Every two to three years, watch fashionable changes. It's why Chelsea fans, some are happy with it, but there wasn't this massive buzz about Raheem Sterling joining because oh, players like Raheem Sterling, were oh, that's, so two, that's so 2018, as opposed to they want something different all the time. But it doesn't make these players bad at what they do. And I think that... You know, it was a year ago, less than a year ago. It was goddamn seven months ago. Chelsea fans were telling us that Jorginho was the best player in the world. And mm. 
I still think with him and Kovacic and Kante, you add in another good, a good quality player, you've still got a very, very good midfield. And yes, it, the whole team fell apart through the back end of last season with everything that was going on. I, don't, I just don't think it's in as bad a trouble as people seem to think it is. They've got Connor Gallagher coming back in that was very good at Crystal Palace last year. So I think they've got some really good options and they shouldn't panic. They should only bring in players that are going to legitimately improve them as a team. And we know they want Declan Rice. And I still think there could be a train of thought at Chelsea to go, I know they so that people want us to go and drop 50, 60 million on, on, on the plan B. But they may just think that the plan A is so much better that we're going to wait. Uh, and it's going to be an intriguing, intriguing one indeed. We have a new membership here. Thank you. Thank you. Very, I'm going to struggle with pronouncing that name, my guy. I'm struggling with that name, if I'm being honest with you, my brother. But thank you for becoming a first team member of the Football Terrace. That means a great deal. And another one here, Anthony. That's an easy name for me. Anthony, <laughs> Anthony has become a squad, a squad member as well. Thank you very much indeed for becoming a squad member of the Football Terrace. Anyone who's new to tuning in, we're talking Jules Kunde. Big reports this afternoon that he is very close to joining and becoming a Chelsea player. But there are contradictory um, uh, reports are also saying he is bound for Barcelona as well with both clubs still looking at him. Now we're going to go to some of these super chats here. I don't want to miss some of these. Um, Grimey here says, don't worry about our midfield. Uh, you should focus on Darwin noodles. <laughs> okay, Grimey. Next time Terry asks me a question about Chelsea when we enter the Chelsea segment, I'm going to tell him no, because Grimey said so. I'm only going to talk about Liverpool. Welcome to the Terrace, where you can express your opinion on whatever the hell you want. So smash a like button and thanks so much for this. <laughs> uh, Dylan here says, uh, Conor Gallagher is that player to speed up the attack in midfield. We don't need to buy uh, is what Dylan believes. A good shout. I, I like, I, I want to see him given a chance and an opportunity, um, Conor Gallagher. I thought he was so good last season at Palace. I just get this feeling you put him around even better quality. He could really soar, um, but we will see. Uh, that's why we, we're we keeping Conor Gallagher. He will be a starter next season is what Nav believes. So quite a few Chelsea fans backing him there. Uh, Ricky here says, don't, Terry, don't worry. Barca will register them soon. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they're going to register most of these players. And I still believe that Frankie Dion is going to leave. Um, I believe that will happen. I, I really do. Um, whether he joins Man United or not is another debate and question, but I still think he leaves Barcelona. Uh, Koulibaly on VVD's level. Uh, if not, he can, can he get there? Is Koulibaly... No, VVD? I don't think he is. I don't think he is. Currently, people like... Listen, I'm I'm not biased because people trying to rob out Koulibaly, which I've not said. I've said he's a top five centre-back in the world, but Van Dijk is in a league of his own when it comes to the centre-backs, with all due respect to, with, to everyone right now, because you've got the, the defenders like the Ramoses, the Thiago Silvas, who are like on the older side of things now, so they're not what they used to be. But when it comes to Van Dijk, he's just in a different le level now when it comes to, to, to centre-backs. But definitely Koulibaly is a top three, top four, top five defender minimum in the world right now. I hear you. Uh, Moon uh, Reader here says uh, Chelsea will get Nunes, the proper Nunes. <laughs> and they <that> would, <laughs> would dig in there as well. But he, that midfielder Nunes that you and Chelsea are looking at, I've been watching a lot of footage of him on Y Scout. He looks serious. He has got everything. He can pass. He's got the physicality. He can run. He's got good technique. Whoever, whoever lands him in, in the Prem has got a serious, serious player on their hands. Thank you He's for that super, super chat. Good. Thank you. We've got some questions coming up about Barcelona and Lewandowski, which we'll come back to later. Um, we are going to talk a little bit more Chelsea and, and, and Liverpool later on the show. So make sure you stay with us. Don't go anywhere, people. Um, I really want to push uh, for Sam's buttons on what he's been saying recently about uh, the start of Liverpool's season. So stay on the terrace. Stay with us. Don't go anywhere. I want to speak. I want to speak Arsenal a little bit. I want to speak, speak Arsenal a little bit here as well. And um, any questions you guys have got about any of the top six, feel free to send them in to us and we will uh, uh, answer them. Arsenal, there's another story circulating that Arsenal could be about to start pursuing or could be in for Leroy Sane. Obviously, they've missed out mm. on Rafinha. They've missed out on Lissandro Martinez. They clearly want a winger, a wide person. Zinchenko looks all but done. That's going to happen. That'll be over the line. And they're going to move for, for, for Leroy Sane next. Firstly, do you think they've got the 
the pool right now, essentially, as in the status, the money, the manager, to bring in a player like Leroy Sane? No, is, is the short answer. I don't think Arsenal have what it takes to attract a Champions League player to play Europa League football, with all due respect. And and this is, you know, something that I spoke about during the season as well. When it comes to Arsenal, they needed to finish fourth because they really needed that we have Champions League pull, which you see, you know, Spurs are, are, are doing really well right now. Spurs, for me, have done the most impressive business, the, like, out of everyone in the league. So when it comes to, to, to Arsenal, I don't think they can attract Leroy Sané, to be honest with you. I think, you know, Leroy Sané is 100% a Champions League player. He's, he's definitely someone that, that is deserving to play Champions League football. So when it comes to Arsenal, I, I don't think Sané is even... He's probably going to pull a Locatelli and not even, you know, just answer the phone. So, you know, I, I'm not I'm not even thinking that's a possibility. I think Sané, even if he does leave Bayern, it's going to be to a club who plays Champions League football. You know, he's he's more likely to go to Spurs now than, than he is Arsenal, in my opinion. I think that's that's how, you know, good he is. He, he deserves to, to, to play Champions League football. I don't think, you know... He he can he he would go to Arsenal, but Arsenal themselves are doing good business. I think Jesus is 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 a good uh, signing. I think that the uh, Fabio Vieira as well is is a good signing. They've done really well for themselves, Arsenal. But once again, they need to to, to get Champions League football this season. So they can't you know do eighth eighth and then fifth fifth. They need Champions League football like badly this year. So for me personally, do I see Leroy Sané becoming an Arsenal player? Absolutely not. I don't think it's possible for me. Uh, I think. I see Sané as a high level elite level sorry elite winger in Europe in in world football so he he definitely ain't going to go to Arsenal I think he's going to go to a Champions League club PSG you know Liverpool City Chelsea Spurs these are different uh, clubs because they got Champions League or he could actually go to you know maybe a Madrid or or a or a Barcelona that that could be a possibility but not definitely not to Arsenal I just don't see that happening so yeah with all due respect to the Arsenal fans before they get triggered yeah, I mean, in terms of the link in itself, I mean, this is, this has come from. I'm, I'm quoting Ben Jacobs here that was on our show the other day. He stated that I've heard, I've not heard rumblings at uh, Chelsea's end, but I've actually heard more rumblings from Arsenal. So it, it feels like Arsenal kind of looking at it and monitoring the situation, as it were. I think Arsenal can sign him though. I think they've got. I think they've got the, the status, the size, the money to bring him in. The problem they will have, and it's the, the opinion that I've held on De Jong all, all summer. Man United could sign De Jong, but if Chelsea or Liverpool or City or PSG tomorrow said, well, we'll match everything, but come to us instead, we're losing him. It's how you guys got Darwin Nunes in front of us. I think that's the fear for Arsenal. And I think Arsenal would try and keep a deal like Leroy or Sane as quiet as they possibly could for as long as they possibly could. Because if somebody else does then try and swoop in, so a a a a, a Liverpool, not that you would. I'm just using you as a, a, a an example. A Chelsea mm. who still need another, who seemingly need another attacker because it was believed that Barca would get either one of them, Bele, to resign or Rafinha, and they end up getting both. So I think it's a difficult deal for Arsenal to kind of get over the line. But I suppose the question around Arsenal is: Have they signed their marquee player yet? Is the marquee player Gabriel Jesus? And this is a question I. I I want to ask you, have they signed that marquee player and it's now about filling their squad? Or is there still that star? Because for me, Rafinha would have been a... I think Gabriel Jesus is an excellent signing. Rafinha, for me, would have been the star signing this summer. For you don't think team. Jesus is a marquee signing? I think, no, I think he's a very good signing. I think he's a very good signing. But I think that if you look at the money they were willing to spend on Rafinha, that, that's their star. That would have been their star player, 9 on 60. Yeah, million. I hear that. I, so I hear that. It's almost, is there another 50, 60, 70 million pound player that Arsenal are going to try and sign, i.e. like a Sane? Not that he would cost that much, but the quality of the player. Or do you think it's going to be sort of Zinchenko level in the sense of sort of 30 to 40 million pound players now for the rest of the summer? And Gabriel Jesus will be the 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 sort of the, the crowning jewel of, of their team type thing. I think, do I expect it to happen? Probably not. But I don't think they need it to happen. I don't think they need that marquee signing. I think Arsenal are in a state now where they need hardworking players. They need players who can implement what Arteta wants them to implement on the football pitch more than anything else. I'll give you an example. If Jordan Henderson could implement the Arteta system 100% at Arsenal, Arteta would probably love to have him at Arsenal. Because I think Arsenal now 
are trying to implement the Arteta system maybe to a T. And you've got these youngsters coming through that keep improving. Saka, Martinelli, you know, the, the, even you've got Sambi Lukonga, you've got other uh, like youngsters for Arsenal who play or playing re who played really well last season. They get them over the line, but they played really well. And you've got as well, Jesus is a youngster himself. So I think... I don't necessarily look at Arsenal and think they need a marquee signing to begin with. I think they need players that can fit the system, that can implement what Arteta wants to do more than anything else. I, I, I'd, I'd not really look on, on the marquee side because if they got two, three more players that, you know, like let's say of a Fabio Vieira level, okay? So he's like someone, okay, everyone knows, but he ain't marquee, he ain't top 10, he ain't top 20. He's just someone who's, who's a youngster, is exciting, is a prospect. If they get two, three more players of that level, then I think that's exactly what they need. People who can implement what Arteta wants to do. People who, you know, have the desire, the passion, the energy. They want to play for it. Arsenal. They want to prove themselves. That's what they're going to get them over the line. I don't think it's the marquee signing. The marquee signing is needed when, when Arsenal cement themselves as a top four club for two years in a row, for example. They cement themselves. They're competing. Then you go get a marquee signing, two marquee signings, and boom, you can go and, and win the league title. Same thing what we did with Alisson and Van Dijk, for example. That's, that's when I think Arsenal need it. As of today, I don't think they need a marquee signing at, at all, to be honest. So. It's an inter interesting take. I mean, uh, Trevor here, one of our members, has said, Terry, which club will hijack Tillemans to make uh, a try factor uh, of hijacks? I think that's what I, I still think. Look, uh, I, I appreciate the comment and, and everything else. I look at Arsenal and I think Arsenal do need more. I would rate their transfer in there right now six Six and a half. Once Zinchenko's done, six, six and a half out of ten. And that's because they need another midfield player and they need another attacker, in my view, to Spurs look like they're going to... Again, this is all on paper because we don't know how any of our teams are going to perform next year yet. But with what Spurs are doing and what I believe Chelsea will finish the summer off with, Arsenal to make top four need two minimum more signings after Zinchenko of a high-level quality. You're talking 35 to 50 million pound players as a minimum. Whether one of them is seen as a bigger marquee signing than Gabriel Jesus is a is a, is a different conversation, I think. But I think they are going to need that. I think they need to go out because there's nowhere else for Arteta to go this year. I mean, they're at a point, Arsenal, where if they, even, if they make top four this season, the following year, they've got to be demanding winning the league. And I say that because no one who's in this top six, you could maybe argue Spurs are, but no one inside this top six is a poor club or a, a, a club punching above its weight. We are all super rich with hundreds of millions of pounds of income that when your manager's been at your club four to five years, the only expectation you should have is we should be challenging for that league title. And that's where Arsenal are right now for me. So I don't think they've got the luxury of kicking the can too much. Now, if their number one target isn't available and they want to wait for him, I get it. But the expectations are there. And I know Gooners are feeling this now. I know Arsenal fans are looking ahead to this season and, and it's Arteta has to make top four look like he's on the edge, on the shoulders of the, the, the cities and the Liverpools and has to look like he could go and win the Champions League the next year in terms of our team looks good enough to be able to do it. Doesn't mean you're the favourites, but the, Man United in the Champions League last year, from the first kick of the season, no one believed we could win the Champions League. As a minimum, when you're one of the top clubs in England, you should start a, a, a league campaign. If you're in the Champions League, there should be a, oh, Arsenal could do it this year. That's where they've got to be. So I think they need to add more because the expectation from their fans is there. And when you go back to Leroy Sane as a player they're linked to, that's the level of player they now need to be going back in for. And if this rebuild is as good as they say, the manager is as good as they say, and I'm talking about the Arsenal fans that support all, all of what the Cronkies are doing, then they have to try and sign players like that. You know, Rafinha was a hard one to do. They nearly did it. They went for Lissandro Martinez. And at the time, United were more focused on a, a different Ajax player. They just missed out. I think they've got to keep aiming this high because they, they need that quality. They don't need, they need a Bowen. They need someone who is Champions League quality already that can go in there and just take them to that next level. And obviously they're linked to a Paqueta as well, who's different. And that would be an example of a new midfielder that would just elevate them, in my opinion, to another level. Um, and I'm, I'm intrigued to see what Arsenal do, because as I said, I would give them a six out of six, six and a half out of 10 right now. If they, if they, if they, if they then went and got Paqueta and Sane, like, I'm giving them a nine and a half out of 10 for that kind of summer. Like I'm talking about that for me would just be sensational. So I, I'm really intrigued to kind of see what Arsenal do next. And, you know, Spurs have bought so many players and I'm getting to a point with Spurs now. And there was a super chat earlier, actually, that says, um, 
Uh, what do I think of the, the Madison signing? I think Madison is brilliant, but Spurs are getting to a point soon where I'm going to say this. I think they're signing too many players. I, You've got to get them all to gel, and you suddenly start going to seven, eight odd players, nine players I've read somewhere they might go up to. Getting them all to integrate year one is so hard. You know, it's so, so difficult. I'm not a fan of it. It's not something I want to see my club do. Five maximum, really. And you kind of grow from there. Uh, Madison would be a good signing, by the way, for Tottenham. They need that creative midfield spot. But Spurs got something that the rest of them don't have, and that's Conte. True. I think Conte, for me, I take Conte as the third best manager in the league. After Pep and Klopp. I think Conte is my third. So because, because Conte is there, Terry, Terry is right. Because historically speaking, and based on previous evidence, when you get too many players, it sort of... You know, takes you a lot of time to gel. You know, sometimes, you know, we've seen these teams that sign seven, eight players. They only start kicking properly maybe in November time, etc. But I think Conte being there speeds up the process because he's a world-class manager. So you could get them to adapt much quicker than we think. Plus, if they've got the quality, they've got the quality. For example, Jed Spence, when I, when I look at Spurs' as business, the best business they've done all summer for me is Jed Spence. I think Jed Spence is the best piece of business they've done over anyone else because Jed Spence is someone who literally has the potential, if he explodes next season, to be the third best right back in the whole league. Genuinely, like you're, you're talking about levels here. So I think Spurs have been going about their business very well. You've got to be Suma who they've signed for not that much money. Longley, I don't personally rate, but he's, you know, if he's going to play in a back three in a Conte system, it might work. So look, there's, there, there's stuff that he needs to put into place. But because Conte is there, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because of who he is as a manager. Mm -hmm. To, to go like, okay, I'm going to implement them all in, in the correct way. So that's, that's what yeah, I think. They're, they're, they're both brilliant. I think Jed Spence, I think Basuma, those two are, are, are excellent players that have come in. And I'm just getting to a point where I'm like, one more. And then I'm like, I think you need to stop just because of integration issues that we've seen before. However, there is the counter argument, as you said, Antonio Conte. And I, I, I'm going to mm. chat. I've got a hot take on Antonio Conte. I think he's the second best league manager in the Prem. Overall, no, but that's, we, we can't do that, though. No, but, but we can, because <laughs> in the league, it, it's, it's still a competition by itself. Do, do you get where I'm coming from? In the league... But, but he still isn't better than Klopp. Overall, no. But I think as a league manager... He's, he's, and he's, even as a league manager. No, twice with Dortmund. Yeah. Have you seen how many league titles Antonio Conte's won? Three? No, he's won more than that. I swear no, he's won three. He's won one with Juve, I think. And... One with Inter and one with Chelsea. Really? I, I swear I read it was more than that. Hang on a minute here. He's won three with Juve, one with Chelsea, one with... He's got five. Oh, you're counting the Juve ones like that? Come on, man. Come on. Context, Terry. What do you mean context, he's got three? He's got three. He won, he won, he context, won three. Terry, context. What do you mean Look, context? Context. Terry, you know, I, you, you can't, we cannot say as a manager in a league because when you're a manager, you're a manager, full stop. No, so, no, I, I understand that, but when it comes to Spurs being in the league, their league performance is going to be enhanced because they've got one of the best league managers in the league. Uh, by the way, the reason I'm saying that is I think Antonio Conte in cup competitions is rank average, rank average. But in terms of a top four place, it matters how good his league ability is. You, you had a manager at Liverpool who was the opposite to that. Rafa Benitez, cup specialist. In the league, meh, meh. He was a bit... Meh, with the yeah, league. I, I, I get that, but it's an overall thing for me. I, I don't, I can't divide the manager into who does better in the league, who no, does I'm better not, in the I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you, you divide the manager like that, but I'm talking purely about where Spurs will end up in the league. Of course, Antonio Conte being so good at league football. Yes. That's going to elevate them. That's my kind of point. I think the same. Yeah, 100%. Like, if, 100%. If Antonio Conte was seen as a cup specialist and Spurs had him, be like, could win a trophy next year with that manager, you know? I think I think that kind of range true. But, I mean, back onto Arsenal for a moment, I, I kind of feel a little bit like, um, you know, they're, they're on the edge of something so, so good this summer, Arsenal. They just, though, need to get over the line with these players. And what they can't afford to happen is to miss out on another major target because I know they're trying really hard with their PR online as fans, and I, I still can't believe... I know why fans believe the PR. PR just makes everybody feel better. The fact that every club gives the same lines. We called our interest. We walked away because we didn't want to be in a bidding war. You know, we never made an official bid. The fact that all clubs say the same thing, just tell... Like, it's like Jack and Nori. We can tell the, tell the telling story here. But they're on the edge, Arsenal, I think, of doing something really, really special next season if they can just get these right 
these right players in. Let's take a look at some more of these super chats here that have come through. Um, her, a gal here says, so Sam, you are embarrassing yourself. Seriously, stop. Uh, is what you gal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know where that's come from. Oh, my God, my God, my God. It's just a gal. We have another member here. Thank you very, very much, Zane, for signing up and becoming a squad member of the Football Terrace. That means a great deal to me. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Let's have a little look here. Uh, this Liverpool fan talking like he's Sane's agent. Bra, you ain't a, tra a transfer market guru, is what Mateos has got Big to up say. to you, Mateos. Um, unfortunately, this is the world of content creation where I'll say my opinion. And in my opinion, Sane won't even pick up the phone call to Arsenal. So, yeah, that's my opinion. So stay angry today. Stay angry. There we go. Uh, Sam here says uh, Sane is staying at Bayern and Asna um, are a joke. I don't, think, I don't think they're a joke, but he could he, he could very much well stay at Bayern. Bayern is a Bayern are a very hard club to get their players away. Not from. to Arsenal, though, Terry. Not to Arsenal. Terry, let's be real. Leroy Sane playing in the Europa League. Come on. This is like a top six, seven winger in the world. You can he, like Arsenal? Come on, man. No, but it, it depends on how well he sells the club. And if a lot of people around Arsenal truly believe this year is going to be special for them. A lot of people at Arsenal feel this is, and I'm just taking them at face value here. This is the year where they get back in the top four. This is the year where they, you know, they 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 almost beat City last year. They played very well against you in certain games. A lot of Gooners believe with the right signings, they are good. I don't like to use this phrase because it's so milk, but they're back next year. And I think that if you're selling that to players, that there's a great chance and opportunity. Let's have a look at Arsenal are back. That's worse than what the Arsenal fans say, you know. <laughs> that's what Arsenal are back thing, honestly. Uh, Nabil here says, Sam, learn football. Maguire is the best centre-back in the world. VVD is not on Maguire's <laughs> level. Maguire scored against United in every game. Fact. Thank you, Thank Fact. you Nabil. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Arsenal couldn't even pull an ugly woman. That's offensive. Um, even she would reject them. Looks, beauty is subjective, but you're saying that even the women that you don't find beautiful would turn down Arsenal. Fair enough there, Nav. Uh, I appreciate the super chat, my friend. Let's take a look at some more of these. Chelsea have three world-class midfielders. They were, but they were off form. Okay, so saying Chelsea have actually, in, I assume you mean Kovacic, Kante and Jorginho are all world-class yeah. and still at Chelsea. Uh, but I don't buy into that because because physically regressing, you, you physically regressing, physicality is important. I think Jorginho has slowed down and Kante has regressed a little bit. And it could be the result of injuries as well. Like, I know on their day, they're world class, but we're talking over a consistent 38 uh, game yeah. season. You could tell that they've fallen off a little bit, not off a cliff, just a little bit. Uh, Leng and Sweet here says Ruben Diaz is better than Van Dice. Uh, just remember that loser Paul <laughs> fans. Do you, do you really just say Ruben Diaz? Yeah. First of all, Ruben Diaz isn't even the best defender. At Manchester City, that would be Emmerich Laporte. He's the best defender at Manchester City. Second of all, Ruben Diaz, when he went to the Euros last season, got changed into a stripper. Don't don't get me to start saying stuff that will get Terry cancelled over here. But Ruben Diaz last summer stank it up at the Euros. So we saw Ruben Diaz outside the Pep system where you have 98% possession. Please stop. Bro, even, even Mo Salah just put him on his ass this season and scored a goal at Anfield. Like, let's allow the, the Ruben Diaz stuff. Ruben Diaz, Ruben Diaz is not the top five defender in the world. Never mind better than Van Dijk. So, yeah. There we go. Uh, Eric Ten Hag is better than Conte, the massive European flop. Uh, Casey, I appreciate your super chat. Right, He's my manager. But no, uh, Ten Hag needs to win. <laughs> he, he isn't right now. You just can't listen. He Ten Hag's done very well. His style of football is is excellent. Of course, you know he, he's got Ajax back to winning in their own domestic where they weren't winning before he came in. But he now needs to prove it in one of the big leagues. If it, look, if, if Ten Hag comes into Man United in the next four years, wins two league titles in a Champions League, and we're one of the best teams in Europe again, it maybe becomes a debate. But until that point. We just don't know. Stylistically, you can say it's better. You know, as I said before, I prefer R&B to uh, opera. But that doesn't mean that Craig David is better than Luciano Pavarotti at singing. You know, there, there, there's a difference there. Uh, Klopp has just four major trophies. Overrated as hell is what KC's got to say to you there. First of all, he's not got four major trophies. He's won it all in England and he's won two Bundesligas and he's won the German Cup. So let's let's not play this game. So, you know, Klopp, Klopp's CV speaks for itself. 
And Mr. Casey, let me ask you a question. Since Klopp left Germany, can you name me the Premier League champions? I'm gonna name them to you. Bayern, 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 Bayern. See, just put yourself on repeat, like Siri. That's that's the the, the champions of, of of Germany since he left. So. We're going to come back um, for, to some more of your super chats a little bit later uh, in the show, especially yours, Nabs, about Lewandowski and stuff. I want to I want to come back to that a bit later. Um, another player linked with Man United today, even Tony. <laughs> I want to even Tony to Man United as a potential replacement for Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, I did have to check the date. I had to check that it wasn't April Fools. Um. No, I'm joking because I quite like Tony. <laughs> I quite rate him, to be honest. I, I want viewers' opinions on this as well. Tony to Manchester United. How much better of a team does it make us? So what, what's your thoughts on that, Sam? See, this is the issue. And I know when I speak to United fans, they're like, they're like, get Ronaldo out of my club. I don't want him to play for my club. I'm like, okay. Have you taken a look at the striker market currently? The striker market in 2022, ladies and gentlemen, stinks. It stinks. After Haaland and Lewandowski, there is no guaranteed player. I'm a Liverpool fan. Nunes is a risk. Everyone's a risk. After Haaland and Lewandowski, everyone's a risk. Jesus is a risk. Nunes is a risk. Ivan Toni is a risk. All of them are risks. Ivan Toni just played his first season in the Premier League. You know, how do you know that he's not going to be the next Michu? That's a genuine possibility. Michu came in, played with Swansea, scored 20 something goals in his first season. Ooh, Michu, you know, he's this incredible player. And then boom, he disappeared. I think Ronaldo, just keep Ronaldo for a year and worry about the striker stuff next season. Allow Rashford, Sanchez. Did I get the. Can, can you see me? Hello? Yeah, yeah, all good. Yep. Okay. Uh, allow Rashford, uh, Sancho. Uh, the the, the uh, young players coming in to 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 get to be given an opportunity under Eric Ten Hag, give them a season so so they can come in and 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 you know show what they're capable of. If Rashford and Martial and these players they stink it up next summer, assess the striker market because currently as things stand, the striker market is really bad, guys. Like genuinely, I'm not even capping. I'm not even saying it's Man United. I'm actually one of the few fans. That and, and Terry knows this. I go on spaces. I do stuff on my channel everywhere. When I speak to United fans, I always I'm the guy that's sort of defending Ronaldo. I'm telling him, look, 18 league goals in a horrendous team, absolutely shit team. 18 league goals. You're gonna remove that now, and people say goals spread out. Blah, blah. I understand, but you still need someone who scores more goals than everyone else. Mm. City had someone who scores more goals than everyone else. Liverpool has more goals than score everyone than everyone else. With Cristiano Ronaldo, he got you 18 goals. Keep him for this season. And next summer, if you just want to move on from Ronaldo, fine. Go get someone else. Go go get, assess the striker market then. Because right now, you're looking at very poor options. There might be a player this season that breaks through, that scores 20-something goals, and you're like very impressed with him. You can go get him next summer. But don't like reduce your level to Ivan Tony with all due respect. Because I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have him anywhere near. But like Cristiano Ronaldo's replacement, Ivan Tony. Are you confident if you sign, let's say you sign Ivan Tony, okay? Let's say you sign Ivan Tony and, you know, you give him a three-year contract. Nothing crazy. Just a three-year contract, you sign him. Next season, let's assume this season you're in the Europa League. Next season you're playing in the Champions League. You are in the same group as Real Madrid. Are you confident in taking Ivan Tony to the Bernabeu? Are you taking uh, confident in taking Ivan Tony to, to the Allianz Arena, etc.? There's levels to this game. Tony can't go from Brentford to Manchester United. Tony can go from Brentford to, to Aston Villa, then bang, then man. I'd actually make an argument that Oli Watkins is probably a better striker to get than, than Ivan Tony. That's that's what I'd say. So I think that's way too much of a decrease. And it's funny because the the way the United fans turned on Ronaldo, you, you sort of wouldn't have recognized that this guy scored 18 goals this season. Well, I think, Only I think... Son and Salah scored more than him. He's I, I 38. Think, I think it's interesting, look, with the Ronaldo thing. I'm not that bothered that he wants to leave because, but it it fits my entire thought process around this rebuild. We were not fixing all the problems year one. Ronaldo leaving now is only a year earlier than leaving next year. Yes, it may mean you have a hole for a year, but we're going to have holes, you know, as long as a, a different, 
let's say you race let's say you sell him for 20 million and you say 26 million in in, in in his salary and then you invest that in a a brand new right back that improves us i'm actually happy happy you're doing that than bringing in a makeshift average striker yep tony's an issue for me though because i like him <laughs> i quite like him so when you sort of said would you have confidence in him right now if you said right we've got to go and play new man united team at uh, the, 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 I was about to say the Camp Nou, they're not that great themselves at the minute. We had to go to the to the Santiago Bernabeu to, to Anfield away on a European night. We had to go to Munich and play and play Bayern. Would I be confident in him at this very moment? No, the answer is no. I'm not even confident in my team right now, even though I've had a couple of decent little moments in preseason games. You know, we, I'm not going to stand there and start celebrating winning preseason. I find it very strange. But I I got I, I, Tony's one of these players that I just want to see, a bit like Ease Basuma, as an example, where I just want to see him, Conor Gallagher, I know he's going back to Chelsea. I just want to see him play in a better team with better players around him. And what's intriguing to me is everybody talks about talent ID. Christian Eriksen was playing for Brentford, looked brilliant. Brentford's style of football, I'm not saying it's identical to how Ten Hag plays, but I think there are similarities to how the team moved the ball, the shape, the hard work. I think there's an element of, well, maybe this look at this player because there is some talent in there. For me, Tony would be a signing that I would like, but not at stupid money. So if they were like, yeah, we want 60 million pound, I'd say no, that's too big a risk because it eats into the budget. But if you could pick him up in this modern day era for 25 million pounds, 30 million pounds maybe. I wouldn't be adverse to that because he gives us something different to what we have now. He's never going to be as good as Cristiano Ronaldo. N never. And I'm not sort of denying that. But remember, a peak Ronaldo would have cost you £250 million in today's market. But I quite I quite like him. I, personally, that's my issue. I've, I've said for a while, I think he could do bits. The only issue I actually have with Tony is I do have slight concerns. And I know people don't like this because they think you, you th they think I'm pulling on an immutable, which I'm not. Some of the things I've seen him say about Brentford when he's been on holidays and stuff, kind of the way he's kind of dug into them a little bit. Now that might just be, it could, I don't know him, so I'm not going to judge him too much. That could just be his humour. And he says those things as a little bit, a little bit self-deprecating. Man United fans sing a song, which is who the F of Man United, where we kind of slag ourselves off. So it could just be his humor. We don't know. So I don't want to overly judge him. But I just, I'd like to understand why he's done that because you think if there is a slight issue there in terms of professionalism, maybe or whatnot, we, Man United need no, need no more of that. But I quite, I quite like him. But what I do agree with, if we can't find a player that Ten Hag says 100%, this is the person that I see for the next five yep. years taking us forward, we wait. And that's why I'm not being a mushroom. I'm not being one of these fungus fans who's looking for a reason to be angry everywhere. And we saw that yesterday from the fungus, from, from the, the mushrooms, when these are the same fans screaming for seven weeks now, just spend the money. And then it turns out we spent 55 million on Martinez in, in its entirety. And they're like, why are you overpaying? You can't ask us just to spend the money, too much money. Cost, and then moan that we spent too much. If you're someone like me that wants us to keep the cost down as best we can, then you have to be patient that these things take time. And then you get the, the counter argument. Oh, oh, but what's the point of negotiating when we paid the asking price anyway? Well, there's a bidding war with Arsenal. No, there wasn't. Yes, they, they bid twice. We bid three times. <laughs> we won the bidding. Like, I love how Arsenal fans are spun it into we didn't get into a bidding war. You bid two fucking times. That's a bidding war. <laughs> Like it's it's honestly it's it's insanity how our fans try and spin these things. But I like Tony. I think he's a good player. I don't know how much better than good he is though. So right now, if you were to rate rank him on a scale of one to ten in the Prem, I'd give him like a six. Can he yeah. with better coaching, better players, a bigger stage, raise himself? And the reason I say that is this: Jota at Liverpool, nobody expected him to be as good, as clinical, and as good a finisher at Liverpool. As he, as he has been, because he wasn't doing that, scoring with that regularity at Wolves. But you put him in a better team with a better system, and he's a much better footballer. Well, scorer. I know you guys don't like calling him a footballer, but like he's a much better goal scorer uh, than others. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm not against it. If we sign Tony, he's one of those players that personally I'd just be a little bit excited about seeing. However, there's a part of me that would also like to see the experiment at him at another big club, because if it does go wrong, <laughs> it, we're not lumbered with him. But I quite like him. I quite like him, to be fair. Even uh, the Jota example that you mentioned, people still criticize him as well. So that's well, the thing. It, people it's never going to end. Like, no, no one's ever going to go like, oh, Tony's the best striker. They just won't take it seriously. 
Is no, Tony I mean, better than Harry Kane? That, that, that immediate question. So. <laughs> well, well, Harry Kane gets that every year. Every year at the start of the season, a striker starts scoring, especially if he's an English striker. And I, I'm assuming Tony's English. I don't actually know his nationality. I've never checked. Uh, he's born in Northampton. Doesn't necessarily mean he represents would represent England. But if he if he started, say he did something for United and he scored six goals in the first five games of the Prem, and Kane was on one, doesn't like August. You would have people go. Kane's got to be dropped for Tony because that happens every year. It's so embarrassing that people want Harry Kane dropped uh, from the England team, especially if you're an England fan. It's very strange. So a super chat here from Alienator uh, says, "I'd rather wait and try to keep the price down." I hear you on. I hear you on that, my friend. Uh, Conte uh, has the same number of Premier Leagues as Klopp. Spurs will finish above Liverpool as uh, a Salah injury derails Paul's season. Not some, not the same for Spurs. Nunes will flop. Are you a bit worried about some of some of the some of the kind of videos going around of Nunes? You a little bit worried about the sort of Lukaku vibe that people are painting him with? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm never gonna, never gonna use preseason to slander a player. Nun Darwin Nunes was not my first choice, as I have said previously on the terrace itself. I've come on and I've spoken on on the Nunes stuff. He ain't my first choice at all. Um, I'd rather have in Kunku when, when I was asked. I would have rather ca- had Lautaro Martinez. But now he's a Liverpool player, so I trust in, in the manager and what he wants. However, 64 minutes of football don't really mean anything, in pre-season specifically. And this is the thing, like, you know, a lot of Liverpool fans, you know, oh, Sam's always negative and this and blah, blah, blah. I'm not. I'm actually objective. And when I look at Darwin Nunes' situation, look, he's a Liverpool player now. Pre-season doesn't mean anything because in 13-14, we signed the man by the name of Iago Aspas. He scored a goal in every single preseason game. He scored goals in Singapore, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in every single preseason game. Come time to play Premier League football, boom. It's 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 not it's not no longer the same thing. And in reverse, last season Mo Salah didn't score a single goal in preseason. Come time the season started, he won the golden boot. So I'm never gonna judge a player based on preseason. I'm not worried at all. Um I would have preferred someone else, but I, I, I have trust in, in the manager and, and what he has going on. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I hear you on that, mate. I I, I do. I do. Uh, Eric Ten Hag polished up uh, Alea and Tadic. Uh, he can polish Tony. And he did. It, it, these are the things. That ten, if Ten Hag can do things like that in the Prem, then you are talking about a special manager. If he, if he was to take a West Ham striking flop <laughs> and turn him into a killer... You're talking about one of the best like man-to-man coaches I think I've ever seen because that very rarely happens in the Prem where you take players that have flopped at other Premier League clubs and then they absolutely kill it at yours. Um, obviously, you've got Mo Salah and KDB, but they're very young, so I don't think the example is the same. Uh, Tony's hold-up play and heading is a one. I'd have him as a backup. Well, that's also a, another case in point. You know, Maybe someone like him as a backup striker could very much work. Casey here says three leagues, one Champions League. It's four. Uh, Bayern Drain started with uh, Henkes, uh, the GOAT German manager. Uh, Klopp was there. Uh, BWO, I don't know what that means. Uh, Bundesliga winner 05 to 2012. Three non Bayern teams won the league. Not special. Are you really counting when he was Mainz manager? That, that would be like counting Thomas Frank as a Brentford manager and going like, oh, why didn't he win the league with Brentford? Mines literally just got promoted for the first time think, in their what, history under Klopp. So let's not do that. I think what he's saying is there was other teams that were winning the league as well, not just Dortmund. So it's almost like a number of no, teams. No, but, but Bayern's uh, like dominance stopped when Klopp got there. That's the oh. thing, because Bayern, I think, won two, three in a row and then Klopp got there one twice, so... Okay, I didn't. Re- okay, I get that now. Uh, Tony is a good player, but as Cristiano Ronaldo replacement, not a chance. Even though I hate him, no one can replace Ronaldo. Uh, 100% facts. I had to check who you supported then. Is a Liverpool fan saying he hate him? I can't stand United fans say they hate Ronaldo. It, it, it freaks me out. Uh, Klopp is nothing but a glorified serial contender. Uh, is what Matt's got. Big up to you, Matthias. Your, your best <laughs> ever manager is Arsene Wenger. Who spent 20 years getting fourth place. So, yeah, you should know a lot about that. Big up to you. Uh, Tony to Man United, lots of laughing emojis. Man United have signed a six foot, a five foot six centre back, is what KDB's got to say. Is got is what he's got to say there. Uh, is there a bigger final? Sorry, is there a bigger final loser manager than flop? 
as in Klopp. No, there ain't. I don't think any manager's lost as many finals as him. The, the elite level, I don't think. Uh, Terry, who are United going after next? I, I don't know. It's in the next person through the door, but it, I'm sure it will be an attacker. Very much feels like they're going to wait until the end. They're going to go the full hog on, on De Jong and wait till deadline day. And it's really interesting what camp people sit in because the vast majority of British press are now essentially saying the player's happy to join. Personal terms won't be a problem. It's all about these deferred wages. He won't leave until Barca make him a, a, a sensible offer on the 17 million that's owed. That appears to be the stumbling block. And if that's the only stumbling block and it isn't that the player doesn't want to join United, I get waiting. Um, but if United do take the gamble and wait, they have got to be 100% sure they can get this done. If you wait until the last day and it don't happen, there's... And I said this the other day. If we have played 34 games with Frankie De Jong, I think we perform better over the course of the season than 38 games with Ruben Neves, even though I like Ruben Neves. So I'm willing to wait, but you ha you have to land him. Like when you go all in, you have to land the guy. So we, we will see there, my friend. Uh, this is from Nav who says, um, we do we continue to put Lewandowski in the world-class category now that he's avoided the Premier League? Um, if he came, he would struggle. Uh, so what does it... So, so what does it come down to status? Uh, so he goes to Barca, world class being debatable for me. I don't think. Listen, he's done it in the Germany. He's done it in the Champions League. He does it internationally. If he, especially if he goes and does it in La Liga, which is the second best league in the world, in my opinion, the hardest league in the world. He's uh, he's already established a world class. I don't think he has to prove himself. But if he goes no. and does it in another league, he's then got two major leagues: Champions League and international football, where he's killed it. I, I don't think it's even remotely debatable that, that he's world-class. Uh, he follows up here by saying, um, I say that because the, the, the word world-class is thrown about like nothing. Is Lewandowski really world-class? I'm curious deep down. It's a question. Listen, he would have won the Ballon d'Or if the competition weren't scrapped. So I don't think you win the Ballon d'Or without being of a world-class level. Um, and Lewandowski, not just a great scorer, he's a great football player as well. So for me, 110%, I would put him into a world-class. And even if you define it differently, Lewandowski's probably been a top three striker in the world minimum for the last 12 years in the world. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Karim Benzema revisionism. Five years ago, Karim Benzema was within the conversation. Everyone was talking about Lewandowski versus Suarez. That was the conversation. So, mm. you know, Lewandowski is is definitely world class. I hear where you're coming from because people just like slap that tag on everyone. But when you're you're top three in your position for the last ten years, you've got to be world class. Like, come on, yeah. it's, it's not a conversation. No, uh, uh, yeah, for me, one hundred and ten percent. I'm not. Yeah, he says I don't. I, I don't dislike him though. No, I get that. I, I think that he is. I think that he is. He's been so the world class thing for me, as you've just said, is the consistency. You can play at a world class level for a year and win a Ballon d'Or, but when you, but when you, you theoretically you could if a if a I don't know. I'm just going to try and name a player who's not world class that plays in the champion. If Mason Mount this year, I'm just using him as an example. And oh, Chelsea fans are going to get upset about that one. No, they're not. They're not. They're not. I don't think anybody thinks he's world class. I think people, many some, people do. I think they say he's got world class ability, but I don't think anyone thinks he's at a world class level right now. But let's just say this season he scored and assisted collectively because it's. I think Ballon d'Or done in seasons now, which is sensible. Let's just say he, he got 40 goal contributions this year. And Chelsea won the league in the Champions League. He could potentially win a Ballon d'Or. But if the following next three seasons, he was back to this year's level, I still might not consider him to have been a world-class player. I would say he's had a world-class season. But to be a world-class player, I think it's those four, five, six, seven years in and around that level. One of the reasons why I've always said that Van Dijk might be the best centre-back in the world right now, but he's also overrated, was this was two years ago when people were saying, I think he's the best centre-back the Premier League's ever had. And I'm like... But there have been people of similar levels to him that have done it for a decade. Like, you've got to match that body of time of being quality. You know, you wouldn't accept a 23-year-old midfielder that has two, two, two seasons on the bounce that are considered the best midfielders, midfield seasons ever. You wouldn't consider him better than Gerrard until he'd been as good as Gerrard as long as him. So I have that same logic for, like, most players. But, yeah, world-class is such an interesting debate uh, that people go through. It really is. Um, I, w I wanted to ask you, actually, we'll go to the rest of the Super Chats a little bit later on the show, people. Put, keep them coming into us. I really do appreciate them. I wanted to ask you, though, about Liverpool. You're linked with a hijack move for Anthony. Um, that's come up about four or five times in the press. I don't quite get it. Maybe, again, Salah's just signed a new deal. They play on the same side of the pitch. It doesn't really make sense to me as a, as a, as a potential deal for Liverpool. But how much more... 
how much more do you need to be able to win the league? And I know you've got a lot of stick for this from a lot of Liverpool fans that don't like you challenging FSG or the way you've gone about it as an example, maybe. But obviously you've signed one player. I know you've signed two kids, but you've signed one established player and he's quite young and roaring himself. How much more do you think you need to be able to win the league? Or or do you think you'll be able to win it without any, any more signings? Where are you at with things? I can sit here and I can guarantee, bar a city catastrophe in terms of injuries, God forbid, I don't want that to happen to them. I'm just giving a hypothetical. Or something crazy that happens. Liverpool are not winning this Premier League title without a midfielder. It's as simple as that. We can sit here and we can, you know, do as much Oxlade, Chamberlain, Curtis Jones, James Miller, Jordan Henderson, Navigator prop as you want to do. At the end of the day, we're not winning this league title without a midfielder signing. It's as simple as that. You can't not address your biggest weakness and expect different results. It's like you're sat at home watching Home Alone for the 1,000th time, but expecting a different outcome. Like, no, the bad guys are not going to get, you know, Kevin McAllister this time. He still is going to get the bad guys because we already watched this movie. So I don't need another season of Curtis Jones just being the same exact player who can't do anything on the football pitch for me to be convinced. I don't need another season of James Milner, yellow card, bingo. I don't need another season of Jordan Henderson back post crosses. I don't need another season of Naby Keita's unreliability and inconsistency. I don't need another season of Oxlade Chamberlain club talking about his dynamism and them and him not playing him for four months. And I don't need another season of Thiago's injuries to know that he's going to get injured. I already have seen this movie before. I would happily send Nunes back to Benfica to have a midfielder. That's how much I think it is a priority. It's such a priority for us to sign a midfielder. The, cl the club itself and people who speak for the club and, 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 and you know, we've, we've spoken about this before, the Positivity Olympics section of my fan base that just want to go on YouTube and be positive all the time. When it comes to Liverpool Football Club, they themselves know that we need a midfielder. That's why we were linked to Shua Mani. If someone can answer the question, why did we want Shua Mani if we truly believe we don't need a midfielder? That's the number one question. Number two question. On the Anthony thing, just quickly, because I think, uh, I don't really think that's going to happen. I think even if we if we do get him, great, I'll clap and stuff. It still hasn't, we haven't addressed like our biggest weakness. Do I think it's going to happen? No. I don't think Anthony's going to happen. I don't think we need it to happen either. I think, I look at that midfield and I just think I've seen this movie before a hundred times already. I don't need to see this movie again for me to expect a different outcome. The outcome is going to be the same. City are going to three-peat. The only time, we, the, the only way we can win this league title is if we go sign a midfielder. Jude Bellingham is not the be-all and end-all. And, and this is sort of the sheepish mentality that, you know, so, you know, sort of the section of our fan base have. All it took was one Paul Joyce article. And Jude Bellingham turned from Jude Bellingham to Zinedine Zidane in the space of 24 hours. Suddenly, everyone became a Bundesliga expert. Suddenly, Jude Bellingham is Zinedine Zidane. Suddenly, Jude Bellingham is the only answer, as if Thiago Alcantara and Henderson are the two best eights in the world. And the only guy who's an improvement on them is Jude Bellingham. So, me personally, I happily concede this league title if we don't sign if we don't sign a midfielder. I'm not I'm not going to lie to myself. I'm not going to sit here and lie to the people. I'm not going to lie as a content creator. I just say it as it is. For me personally, without us signing an eight, we're not winning the league. It's as simple as that. That's just how I see it. If we go do sign an eight, then this whole conversation shifts. It switches. So that's that's how bad I think we need a signing. And it's different getting to, to, to the hill versus getting over the hump. For us to get over the hump, we need that midfielder. Every single game, we've dropped points in the season. It's been lack of control in midfield. Losing control in midfield, losing the midfield battle. It's been the same thing every single time. It's not like there hasn't been a shock result where it's hit Van Dyke in the knee and it rebounded off Alisson's armpit and we considered the goal. It's always been the same stuff. Midfield, 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 midfield. So for me personally, if we don't sign a midfielder, we don't win the league. It's as simple as that. So yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I agree with you completely. And I know that a lot of Liverpool fans will think I'm just saying that to sort of rub you know, try and you know, rub salt into the wound, as it were. But City have improved so much. And again, we are talking on paper. And as you say, City could shock us all this season and be awful. It not work. Haaland be injured. Calvin Phillips gets exposed. And they have a terrible season, Liverpool in the league. And, and Liverpool fans will say, see, I told you. But I think you have to plan for City being the best version of themselves. That That's how you plan. Otherwise, yeah. you win, 
ironically, you winning the league becomes what a lot of things, ba- what's been banned about a lot in recent years, it becomes a false position because you're only there because City have been bad. You need to be able to beat City man for man. Terry, player. you know why Tom Little, you know Tom Little's the guy who comes on the terrace, you know his reason to why we can win the league is because City got more starters in the World Cup, so they're going to get tired and come back and lose the league. See, see the logic I'm dealing with? Like, that's the logic I'm dealing with. Their logic is Liverpool are going to have the best case scenario and City, like, Haaland is going to RKO Pep through the table. Alvarez is going to two-foot Laporte in training. They just, like, it's all, like, mad hypotheticals. You don't plan to fail. You fail to plan. Going into another season without a midfielder is us planning to fail, failing to, to plan, sorry. So it's as simple as that. We're just going once again. It's like every single time. It's just we fuck up one thing, like every single time, every single summer. Oh, why is a backup right back so important to Sam? You don't trust Milner up until Milner plays backup right back at home to City. Oh, why is a number eight important to Sam? Do you not trust these players up until Curtis plays against Man City, Curtis plays against Brighton, Ox plays against Leicester, etc., etc. And you see the same stuff. Just take, take pen and paper. Write down with me if you're a Liverpool fan. Write it down on on, on a paper. Thiago will not be fit all season. Write it down 10 times and read it to yourself. Wake up. Thiago will not be fit all season. Just keep saying it to yourself. Because Thiago Alcantara has had a massive injury history since his Barcelona days. This has been Thiago Alcantara. So it's going to happen again. He's going to get injured again. So for me, I want to be proven wrong. Because me being proven wrong is us winning the league title. But it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I've seen, and I've already pre-season two games of Curtis Jones. The same exact shit I've seen for the last two, three years. The same player. Shit decision-making. Dribbles a little bit good. Passes a little bit good. Shoots a little bit good. Nothing special. It's just that that's the issue, Terry. It's just like that one missing piece you need that's going to get you over the hump. And we decide, no, let's not go get that missing piece. Let's once again try to risk it all. So I mean, it's just not going to happen, man. City City are winning the league without us signing. I, 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 get, I get where you're coming from, mate. And I think that it's... I understand being positive about your club and, and everything else. I and I, I do understand it because I'm asking Man United to you only buy the players that are that are primary targets that definitely improve you to it to a certain degree. And again, if Liverpool wait because they know 100 percent next year they're getting Jude Bellingham, I, and they have to wait money wise, then I do kind of get it. At the same time, though, you're essentially conceding this le- this league, and I think that what the funniest thing I, I hear from Liverpool fans is, well, you all said last year that we didn't have enough to finish in the top four. No, we didn't. And I, I'm talking about the terrace. It's like we were talking about hypotheticals where if Liverpool had two or three bad injuries, could they fall out the top four? Everybody predicted Liverpool to be in the top four. Most predicted them to be in the title race. The irony in it was what got you back into the title race was the January signing of Luis Diaz. <laughs> you know, where you sort of, again, I know this is, I looked at it like if you'd have had him from the beginning of the season, you'd have won the league. Different outcome. Agreed. Agreed. And, and again, it's all everything's hypothetical, but that's the whole point of being a football fan, talking football. If we got rid of all hypotheticals in football, all the if, buts and maybes, there'd be nothing to talk about. <laughs> like, there'd be nothing. So you have to talk If we didn't sign Luis Diaz, the whole thing that happened wouldn't have happened. Genuinely, genuinely speaking, not one of the things that happened. We we wouldn't. I I I'm not even lying. If if we didn't sign Luis Diaz, the whole run we made from January till May wouldn't be possible. He wouldn't. It wouldn't have been possible. That's how much one signing elevates the people around them. Rio Ferdinand, Roy Keane. I remember, and I think it was one other Man United player. They sat down and they were speaking about this once. I think it was like on one of one of the interviews or something like that. And they came out and they said, sometimes when you get one class player. You, as soon as you see him in training, it just elevates everyone around him. If Nicolo Barella walked in to Liverpool tomorrow, suddenly everyone's a bit, everyone's more confident. The fans are more confident. The coach is more confident. The team's more confident. The, his own teammates are more confident. So it's just like this this whole thing, the, the, the whole theory, the ideology that one player doesn't make a difference is massive cap. Just look at Liverpool themselves, exactly what Terry just said. Diaz signed in January, and we went on that mad run. Where if we didn't well, sign him, that run wouldn't have happened. Look, 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 Man United, 1999, we already had a very good squad. We already, and we signed some very good players. And yeah, that was, I, I want to say, and I'm going to go check this now. I was obviously very young, but that was the summer where we signed Yap. Yap Stam, as an example, I believe that was a year. I want to go and double check. He's 50 now. My God, I feel so old. Yes, that was the summer we, that we signed Yap Stam. And I, I'm actually going to go back to that summer because I want there's a reason that I, w- I want to bring that up. 
And Man United had a good summer that so far. You know, Yapstam had come in. We already had a very good team. We weren't wasn't like we were rebuilding in, the, in in any kind of way. We were just needing to add new players to the team. I want to scroll back to that summer because I know we signed somebody else. I want to make sure I get these names right. So that summer we signed Yapstam, and we'd signed Jasper Blunquist, who, who was a good squad player for us. But then on practically deadline day. 17 million pounds, which back then was a lot of money, 15 million pounds, the Amsterdam cost. We brought in Dwight York. And Dwight York was a catalyst for the trip for the treble winning season. I believe if we missed out on Dwight York, we do not win the treble. Not just for, because of his goals, but the partnership and friendship that he created with Andy Cole as an example. The extra rotation that it gave us. We had four, everyone used to play 4-4-2 back then. We had four top-class or world-class strikers between Teddy Sheringham, um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And, you know, if we didn't have him, it would have been it would have been a kid. It would have been a kid or someone that wasn't quite good enough being rotated in. You would have dropped points and missed out in moments on those games. There was a feeling that he brought to the club. And for the first three or four years, Dwight York had this amazing energy around the club. He'd become a little bit of a, a bit of a bit of a bit of a naughty boy in the latter stages. But in those early years, it was this energy from him, this vibrance from him, this, this, this great attitude that he had, professional on the pitch, worked hard in training and everything, but brought some life to the club, an extra life. And it was a character. And that word character, those soft facts have played down so much. And I think you'll find that Luis Diaz, for one reason or another, did very similar things when he came in in January. It was like an injection into the squad. And that's why you're better off getting your signings done in the summer because you have that impact all year. And I get a feeling that what could happen to Liverpool this year, I still think you are going to be there or thereabouts. You can still win any of the cup competitions and you're still going to have a very good season. But without that midfielder, without that extra player or two, City squad is just going to be too deep, too strong, too good. I can't see all their signings failing. Two of them are Kukure will probably go there. Two of them are Premier League proven, excellent footballers. And Haaland is a game changer. Like if Haaland scores at the rate people expect, that by itself could make them impossible to catch. And I just think that Liverpool need to do that little bit more to get over the line. But of course, I say it and people are like, well, focus on your own club. Well, I do focus on Man United, but we talk top six on here. And I think Liverpool are brilliant. But I just, if I was a Liverpool fan, I'd be really unhappy with the, with the lack of additional signing. So I, I do agree. Um, a few super chats here. This says, well, Puketa would be perfect for Liverpool. He can play eight and 10, right wing, false nine. Young Flair uh, scores goals, also uh, has a lot of defensive numbers. Uh, listen, he is such a good player. His preferred position also is, is, is an eight. He's very, very good. Uh, what additions additions do you believe Chelsea need to compete for the league this year before sanctions and losing wingbacks we were top of the, the Premier League you were look I think we said it already on the show you obviously need to fix the back line because you lost defenders and you're doing that I think another midfield player is needed and you need somebody else that's either creating or scoring goals like that needs to happen you know Lukaku's gone you bought in Sterling great you still need more goals and the, I think you'll add, add someone else in that area Spencer thank you uh, LVP uh, needs uh, needs a, a Barella Verratti more than Jude Bellingham. Oh, Liverpool, he means. Yeah, uh, yep. uh, World, World Cup has impact. Uh, Modric, Pogba, Varane were in 2018. Um, no one's denying that, but we're saying your hopes on winning the league title can't be based on City having more starters in a World Cup. You have Wait. to prepare... Liverpool to win against the best version of City, not the worst version. Yeah, because when it comes down to real the reality of the matter, it's almost a case of well, what if two or three of those City City players have got started? What if, they, what if their nations go out early? <laughs> like that the whole plan's out the window. There's no way Klopp's sitting there going, right, I think we'll win the league because of that. Like there's just it's fan theory. It, 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 there's no basing in reality for it. Um, listen, everyone who has tuned in, a massive thank you to each and every single one of you. For Sam, always a pleasure to sit here and speak football with you, my friend. Tomorrow, people, we're back in the morning. Dean Jones in the afternoon and then the Top 6 show live at 6 p.m. So make sure you are here. But until next time, everybody, take care of yourselves. Goodbye. God bless. And we'll